morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm Marin Lead at CSIS. I'm a senior advisor in the Harold Brown Chair here. Um, this is the first event in a series of events that we'll be doing, hopefully, with all of the services on their future rotorcraft issues uh, as part of a broadened version of the ground forces dialogue. We're now starting the security dialogues to deal with sort of cross-cutting joint issues. And so um, this is a reschedule of something we'd hoped to ho hold earlier. We were also hoping to hold a Marine Corps rotorcraft event a couple of weeks ago that got snowed out, so uh, we're off to a slow start, but happy to finally get this underway. Um, very honored this morning to have with us Brigadier General John Ferrari, who's the military deputy in program analysis and valuation on the Army staff. Um, Colonel John Lindsay, who's the director of, oops, sorry, Colonel Frank Tate, <laughs> who's the chief of aviation force development in Army G8 on the Army staff, and Colonel John Lindsay, who is the director of aviation in the Army G3. To talk, um, I, I assume that most of our discussion today will focus on the restructure uh, initiative that the Army's put forth for its uh, helicopter fleet going forward, but also want to spend a little bit of time talking about what comes after that and, and the longer term future of Army aviation. So again, very happy to have all three of you here. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, General Ferrari, over to you. Well, first, thanks to uh, yourself and CSIS for hosting this event. We were supposed to do it a few weeks ago. But it was before the release of the president's budget, it got delayed, and uh, so so we had to cancel because of all the all the things. So thanks for everybody for coming out. I know everybody's everybody's busy. Uh, the army, as an institution, has been taking budget reductions now for several years. If you go back to 2012 and you looked forward to the 2016 budget, uh, which is a year from now. Uh, or the 2015 budget this year, we thought we were going to have about $150 billion, right? So you fast forward now to 2015 to the budget that's on the Hill, and it's about $120 billion. So that's a 20 percent reduction in buying power in a very, very short period of time. The Army has three places that it puts its money. It puts it in structure, which is people. So the Army is about people. We equip our soldiers. The other services are, have much more procurement in their budgets, but we're, we're people. That takes up about 50 percent of our budget because we are people-centric. The rest of the money, about 30 percent of it, goes to readiness in current operations, not including the war. This is all base budget. And then another 20 percent of it goes into modernization. And those percentages vary over time. But when you take a steep budget cut very quickly, you can't reduce the payroll fast enough. So it means your modernization and your readiness accounts suffer for a couple of years until you can right-size the force. So the instructions we got as we were going through this sequestration budget build, which was built upon the previous Gates budget reductions, together is about a billion dollars. The Army's share of that trillion dollars over the 10 years, about 500 from the first, 500 billion from the second, was 33 percent. We only make up 24 percent of the defense budget, so we got, as an institution, disproportionately reduced. The instructions from the, 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 the Office of the Secretary of Defense were, as you're balancing and reducing the Army, make sure that when you get out to 2019 that the Army is balanced not hollow, and what they mean by that is that you've reduced your structure enough so that you have enough readiness dollars to be ready, and a smaller force has to be ready, and you have enough modernization dollars that you're not, at the end, have, have unmodernized equipment. And so what we did was we looked at the modernization budget which a year ago, before I came into pa and &E, I was in the force directorate that was in, we, we were, along with our acquisition counterparts, putting together the equipment budget. And the equipment budget is three bins, S&T, development, and modernization, and, and procurement. And we decided that we we're going to protect the future seed corn, which is S&T. We weren't going to take a procurement holiday in the traditional sense of stop buying stuff for the force today. But where we were going to take the risk in procurement was in development of new systems 
and hence you saw the ground combat vehicle, and then the aviators will talk about the impact that had on their portfolio. And so as we move forward and protect that stuff, that means incremental improvement to the systems you have today rather than developing new platforms. We went through a budget review process within the Army that was compressed because we got the fiscal guidance in July and had to turn in the palm in September. Lots of stakeholders, lots of participation, and then we conducted a, a review within the Office of the Secretary of Defense where they made changes, and it went through CAPE, then it went through the three-star programmers, which is all the services. We can get into more detail later, but up to the Secretary of Defense who finally made all the decisions on all the different pieces. And it's a transparent process, but like any budget process in the Department of Defense, right, everybody has a say, but in the end, when the decision's made, there are very few people who come out actually happy, right? I mean, especially when you're taking away that much amount of money, uh, right? There's lots of compromise and lots of give and take. And so as part of the discussion was aviation restructuring initiative. And so for the details of that, I'll turn it over to, to Frank Tate, who'll tell you how the aviation piece fit within the broader restructuring of the Army. Thank you, sir. And again, thank you, Marin and CSIS, for giving us this opportunity. It's good to see so many familiar faces out there. As General Ferrari has said, one of the, one of the biggest challenges as we go through this sequestration budget is for Army aviation, because Army aviation is such a large percentage of the overall Army budget. Uh, I manage the equipping dollars for Army Aviation, and so I'll use that as one example. If you take a pre-sequestration 12, uh, 16 Palm numbers and compare, compare those to the 15, 19 Palm, we go from uh, $7.5 billion a year in equipping dollars in the aviation portfolio down to $4.5 billion a year. That's a truly substantial percentage cut taken out there. And the Arm, Army Aviation is over 20 percent of the Army's total equipping budget. Uh, correspondingly, though, if you look at our sustainment dollars and our training dollars, the Army Aviation is a huge portion of those as well. And we took upwards of 40 percent cuts in those areas because, again, the Chief and the Secretary are limited in where they can take cuts from until such time as we start getting below 490,000 uh, in terms of personnel. And so Army Aviation took a large portion of those cuts. And that's what drove us to look very carefully at how we would structure Army Aviation. The original proposal for how we would take those cuts was to cut five aviation brigades, three out of the active component and two out of the National Guard. Cut them entirely and every aircraft in them, and that meant Chinooks, Blackhawks, Apaches, even new LUHs that had been acquired. All of our best equipment was going to be divested out of the Army to pay this bill. And so as we took two steps back and took a second look at that, it made no sense whatsoever. We were going to cut combat power, cut the pointy end of the spear to pay this short-term bill and not solve any of the additional problems that we have in Army aviation from our training fleet to our modernization and how we're going to continue to go forward. It made no sense. So we went back to the drawing board. And after going back to the drawing board, we sort of settled on four basic principles that we wanted to use as we went forward with Army aviation. The first one being to provide a modernized, ready, tailored aviation force. And the biggest part of that was let's keep all of our most modern, most capable, most survivable aircraft and equipment that we've taken all this time to build up and procure, our Blackhawks, our Apaches, and our Chinooks. And let's divest as much of the old legacy Vietnam era type equipment that we had, of which we have a lot, and use that to pay the bill. So that was one of the fundamental principles that we went in here. The second was to develop and train 21st century aviation leaders. Much of the way we are training aviators today is still geared on the way we trained aviators coming out of Vietnam. And so we want to fundamentally relook that and stop training uh, geared on the way systems were and aircraft were in those days and look more at the systems that we expect to have as we go forward. Multi-engine, glass cockpit, moving map, information dominance, bringing in UAV feeds, all those types of things are what we should start focusing aviators on right from the start. And then adapt aviation design for efficient and effective support. As we get smaller, 
we have to move aircraft around to where they can give the most benefit. Some high, low density, high demand assets like H-64s, we end up moving all to the active component. But where we have now an opportunity to retain additional Blackhawks and move those into the reserve component, we do that where they are both incredibly useful in combat, but also tremendously useful to our states and to the homeland. And then lastly, enhance the efficient, uh, efficiency of our sustainment. And again, we go from seven aircraft fleets down to four. Focus all of our dollars, all of our modernization and sustainment on four fleets rather than seven. So those are sort of the fundamental principles of what we do in the Aviation Restructure Initiative, and I know in question and answer we'll get into some of the more details. But with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Colonel John Lindsay. Uh, thanks. We just wanted to give you a little bit of insight into one of the big ideas as we were uh, formulating the plan last year and discussing uh, some of these lines of effort, some of these big ideas, uh, the idea of keeping our best stuff, keeping our most modernized equipment and imagining the future uh, that we were going to live in 15, 20 years down the road. And one of the big ideas, of course, that we had and embraced was that we are moving toward an unmanned world, more towards an unmanned world, not completely unmanned, but certainly uh, many of our systems, both ground and air, are going to be unmanned. So we wanted to wrap our arms around our unmanned systems and see how we could uh, best take advantage of that. And so that really gave uh, us some thoughts about matching our shadow UAS systems with our Apache helicopters. Now, as many of you know, we have already planned on moving our Gray Eagle capability to our divisions, and that's, uh, that's important for, for the Army. That plan's underway. Uh, we're going to have those companies resident in our aviation brigades for safety and standardization purposes, although it'll be a divisional asset. But matching that capability with our Apaches is, uh, was recognized as important long ago. But what we took advantage of with the Aviation Restructure Initiative was, again, the Army's original plan of divesting shadow UAS systems due to the downsizing or reorganization of our brigade combat teams. Those uh, assets, those UAS platforms, would have otherwise been divested from the inventory. And so we took those systems, and the big idea is to put them in the hands of the people who are going to get the most use out of them. Give us, give the Army, uh, lessons about how to employ and utilize those systems. We're going to learn a great deal from uh, those folks uh, once they have that capability in their hands. Again, uh, we'll have a company per uh, each battalion cavalry squadron in uh, each uh, divisional cav, or uh, divisional combat aviation brigade, or aviation brigade, I should say. So uh, I think that's... Uh, that's, a, that's so, a start on, 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 the, on the structure, and Frank will talk a little bit about the manned, unmanned teaming aspect of, uh, of that. So in the end, we had to take tremendously difficult cuts in Army aviation, very large cuts because we're such a large percentage of the budget. But by restructuring, we found a way to take those cuts, we take 23% cut in the active, about an 8% net cut in the National Guard as an example, but do so while increasing our capability in the homeland and for the states, increasing our overall manned unmanned team capability, teaming capability, and still meeting the preponderance of our overall requirements, especially those warfighting and MCO requirements. Uh, and, and that was what most important to us. So we keep all 690 of the Army's acquisition objective of AH-64Es, all 2,135 UH-60s all 533 CH-47s, all of our best combat power we retain despite taking these difficult cuts. Thanks to all of you for a good uh, opening, laying the groundwork of some of the issues that you were thinking about. Um, I do want to make sure that we have lots of time for questions because I know there are a number of them out there. Um, one of the things we wanted to do in putting this together was offer an opportunity for the public to ask questions because uh, while this is, there's been a lot of press coverage and, and hearings and the like, I think um, much less opportunity for give and take with the people who put the plan together. So um, I want to 
we'll, we'll open this up in a minute. Uh, I also want to tell people out there watching on the web, if you have questions that you would like for me to ask, um, please send them to me at mlead, M-L-E-E-D, at C-S-I-S dot O-R-G, uh, and I can try to keep track of them up here and, and ask them as we go. Um, let me start with a couple of questions. Um, first, I want to take it back to the future a little bit. I mean, so you had a plan for modernizing aviation. Um, presumably, now that you have consolidated um, your fleet into the most modern capabilities, that plan has shifted somewhat. So um, I think sort of the next step was the joint multi-role and then the future vertical lift. So, and uh, Lieutenant General Phillips, the outgoing uh, military deputy to the Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, has talked about the importance of, in particular, joint heavy lift. But so how does the restructuring initiative affect uh, the the future of Army aviation, aviation beyond the current fleet? That, that's a great question uh, because what aviation restructure does is salvages our plans to modernize the aviation fleet. Where we were headed was down a dark road for aviation where we could not afford to continue to modernize and certainly not afford to continue to modernize across all of our components. And here's what I mean by that. When we were trying to keep seven fleets alive, we were going to have to spend so much money to do that that we were lowering our rates of procurement on our biggest systems. For instance, uh, Apache and Blackhawk, as we go forward, pushing those programs all the way out to the end of the 2030s before we buy those programs out, which in turn then increases the money that we had to spend on sustainment of the UH-60 Alphas and UH-60 Limas. All of those increased bills take away from our ability to spend money on future vertical lift, ITEP engine, and things of that nature. What happens is, you know, there's a lot of industry here as I look out there, all right, and they'll be the first to explain to you that there's an economic order uh, rate that if you go below, your costs start to rise exponentially. If you, uh, I'll take Blackhawk as an example. If I can buy a Blackhawk at $16 million for a mic model uh, at this rate, but now I can only afford to buy it at this rate, and now they're $23 million a piece. I'm getting the exact same Mike model Blackhawk. I'm just paying a lot more money for it over a lot more years, and I'm sustaining the old Alpha model for longer. All the money that that takes out of the programs <coughs> is the money that's going to buy us future vertical lift. And so by consolidating into these smaller numbers of fleets and consolidating all our dollars, which we were able to do, General Odierno has allowed us to keep the money in aviation, we didn't become a big bill payer for everything else. So those modernization dollars we kept, but now we're able to get back on track for those key modernization uh, systems. So additionally, so I, last year I sat on the Joint Capabilities Board that feeds the JROC, and I sit on the FBL Executive Steering Group. And so we, we ensured as we structured that program and the timelines that it was synchronized with the changes we, we in the Army were making. So there were, there were some people that wanted to start the analysis of alternatives and the, and the, the milestone acquisition decision, start the program for FVL right away. But given the, the dramatic cuts, we couldn't, we couldn't afford it. And so what we did was approve the, the initial capabilities document in draft, right? So that had never been done before. Normally it comes in and it gets approved. But it was approved in draft only to allow industry and remember, we talked about protecting the S&T. So as the budgets were coming down, we protected this technology demonstration that we're running uh, that, that will help inform the cost analysis and the requirements for FVL. And we're looking sometime out in 2017 to really take that effort, marry it together with the analytics, and then be begin the process of doing that. So it's a different way of running the program where normally you would start off at the milestones and then do the cost analysis. But if you don't understand the trade-off between cost and requirements, right, that's where programs generally go, you know, off the rails for cost. So that the, what we're trying to do is use this time now where we don't have a lot of money to get the S&T and the technology straight to inform a better decision on the FVL in the 2017-2018 time frame. Um, one of the 
most uh, the, a, the aspects of the proposal that I think has garnered the most attention has been with respect to the Apaches. And so I wanted to ask two questions about that. First, um, some questions raised about the utility of the Apaches for the scout mission. Um, and second, um, the disagreement between, or the apparent disagreement between the active component and the guard about um, whether or not it's appropriate to have all the Apache capability uh, solely reside in the active. So if I could ask you guys, and then, and then I'll open it up for questions to the audience. So before we jump into the Apache, right, I think it's important, right, everybody does highlight where there's a disagreement. We don't talk enough about where the process came together, where, where both components and with OSD came together to work out where we agree. Right, so first off, Frank talked to you about the reductions initially, right? Had the National Guard losing two aviation brigades and the active duty was losing three, right? So par as part of the deliberative process, right, it was brought to our attention that the Guard wanted to retain their aviation brigades. That was important to them. And so we worked out where as part of this restructuring, they get to keep their brigades. And in the reserve component, which is the Guard plus the Army Reserve, right, we started with 12 aviation brigades, we're going to end with 12 aviation brigades. Those aviation brigade headquarters will be the same in all components, and they can task organize then just like we fight. Also LUH, right, so initially we, as part of the restructuring plan, we, the light utility helicopters, 100 from the active, we're going to go to Fort Rucker, and 100 from the National Guard, we're going to go from Fort Rucker. Right, during the deliberative process with OSD, right, the decision was made by the Secretary of Defense that in this year, in FY15, we're going to buy 50 or 55 additional LUHs so that the Guard doesn't lose that. And if sequestration is avoided in the President's plan, next year we'll buy out the remainder so the Guard doesn't have to lose any LUH, yet we still meet the requirement for 200. If full sequestration comes into effect, and we're stuck at $120 billion, then, then we can't afford to buy those last 45, and those will have to move. But, but the intention is, right, and that dropped the number of helicopters the Guard was going to lose from over 200 down to 111. The other thing was the modernization of the UH-60s, right, the, getting the Alpha models out and, and, and modernizing them and getting the most modern aircraft to the Guard. This plan enables that. It enables that as the aircraft are passed to the National Guard from the active component, those 111, they will be modernized aircraft. It also enables the Black Hawk program to continue to incrementally to be funded so that we can continue the modernization at a faster rate and buy out those things. So we'll talk about the Apaches, but there's a large part of the plan in give and take where so, so the plan started as an, an Army plan, total force, went into the review. The National Guard came in with a counterproposal. It went through lots of machinations, lots of reviews internally to DOD, and then came out a different plan. And that's how the budget process works. And I'll let Frank talk about the Apaches. Thanks, sir. Let's talk first about the first part of your question, which is the capability of the H-64 to perform the scout role. There's a, uh, there's a few old dogs out there that, that uh, might be saying, hey, I used to fly Alpha model Apaches, and it just wasn't suitable to be a scout and those kinds of things. But what I can tell you is all that changed in 2007 when 1st the 82nd became the first unit equipped with the MTADs, or the uh, Modernized Target Acquisition and Designation System. Uh, under the command of, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Fee, they were part of the brigade that I also commanded a battalion at the same time during the surge in Iraq. And the MTADS was the game changer because it is uh, the best sight that we have on any of our uh, rotary wing helicopters out there today, far superior to what we currently have on the uh, Kiowa Warrior, and therefore gives a far superior scouting capability in that regard. But then when you double that by adding in teaming with unmanned systems, which we will continue to modernize and improve and develop TTPs for, that's where you really get the synergy to have the best capable scouting aircraft team on the battlefield. 
And this was validated after we canceled the uh, armed reconnaissance helicopter program and conducted an analysis of alternatives about how we were going to go forward. And in that analysis of alternatives published in 2011, it was determined that the best capability, shy of building something from scratch, was to team H-64Es with unmanned systems. That was the best way of all the system to include an improved Kiowa warrior teamed with unmanned systems. It was the Apache Echo model with unmanned systems. So we're very comfortable and confident that this is the best capability out there and that not only that, with the now having for the first time organic man-unman teaming all the way down to the CAV troop level, that we're going to develop TTPs that far exceed what we've even had success with in theater already. So that's the first piece, is in terms of the capability. I think the second piece you ask about, though, is, is this idea of, well, isn't it good to have, you know, that capability within the reserve component? The issue there is not whether it, there's some benefit to having it in the reserve component. The issue there is, again, low density, high demand. There's only going to be 690 Echo Model Apaches. All right? Anything beyond that, now we're getting into increasing what the Army has to procure and to buy beyond what we've programmed for. So if there's only 690, remember, we're going from 37 shooting battalions, if you will, right now, 37 either attack battalions or arm reconnaissance squadrons in the Army today, <coughs> down to 22, down to 22. And with only 22, when you put that into any of your track modeling or anything else, the only way to fulfill the MCO requirements in combat is if those reside within the active component where they both maintain a higher study of readiness to begin with, and then if there is a longer duration fight than we are hoping for, their ability to turn more rapidly into that fight meets the demand. If we were going to have still 30 or 35 battalions, then it would be ideal to continue to spread some of that into the reserve component. But at only 22 battalions, they've got to be in the active component, if that answers your question. Uh, let me open up to the audience. Um, if people could raise their hands, if they have questions, they'll come around with mics. Please identify yourselves. Uh, be brief, if you could. Um, and and if I also forgot to mention if people have cell phones on, if they could turn those off. Also, if people want to tweet us questions, they can do that at at, at CSISGRND forces. So, so feel free to... audience, right? No tweeting. That's right. <laughs> so just raise your hands if you've got questions. Otherwise, I'll keep firing away from up here. If you just went up here. Hi, Jen Judson with Inside the Army. Um, I know that there is a, a National Guard Bureau um, counterproposal circulating on the Hill right now. And I know you sort of started to touch on the argument as to why some of these counterproposals may not work. But I'm wondering if you could elaborate on why this specific one that has been circulating over this past week um, does not work for the Army. Right, I'll let uh, Frank and John get into the details. But their proposal, right, takes risk in the number of aircraft and where those aircraft are delivered or, or are stationed because you need you only have 690, and Frank will, will run you through the distribution of those aircraft under our plan and under the counterproposal, and why that results in, in our belief, it results in a less ready force. The second thing is cost, right? So, so their proposal, uh, in, part of their proposal is there would be 60 UH-60 aircraft that, that would have to be divested. Uh, so our intent is, as part of restructuring, is not to divest those, so there's higher operating costs. And uh, the last piece is the collective training capability. Frank talked about the UAVs, but, but, it's, but it's more than that. It is true that in their proposal, you would have more battalions of AH-64s, right? Specifically, there would be six in the National Guard, and they would provide you individually trained pilots, because we only resource in the for the National Guard in a 10-year period, right? They're resourced to be an individual crew squad for about six of those 10 years, at platoon level for about two of those years, and then the other two at company level. So that's what, the, that's what they train at, and that's what we resource them. And for those helicopters, that takes a significant amount of days for them to accomplish, 
right? So what, what we didn't want to do with our proposal was to have more units we, we focused on was the capability, the combined arms capability. It's taking the Apache battalion that's trained at the battalion level, teaming it so that it can train together with the UAVs, teaming it with the reconnaissance battalion of Apaches so they can train together, teaming it with the maneuver unit, with the fires unit, and a division headquarters. Right? One of the things that, that, as I've been going through this, right, that, that what I've learned, right, as we learn more about the Guard, is they talk about how they bring the equipment and the organizations to where the people are. And that is a significant strength for our nation, because that retains a lot of capacity. In the active force, we bring the people to the organizations and the equipment. Right? Two different models, when put together, make us an extremely powerful and effective force, as we found over the past 10 years. Each model has its strengths. Each model has its weaknesses. And as you look at the force mix, there are certain capabilities that are in the reserve component and certain capabilities that are in the active component. Patriot, right? Patriot is 100 percent in the active. And so for the Apaches, what we're looking for out of these attack battalions is that integrated teaming with the UAVs, the ground forces, all at the same location so that we can get a collective capability in support of the divisions. The other thing it aids is the training, the collective training of that division. Because under their proposal, the active component would be short two battalions. And so I'll let Frank walk through the, the details of the actual aircraft count and the uh, cost. Thanks, sir. The, the main issues with the Guard counter proposal are that, first, it does not meet the warfighting demand. It's a lower uh, performance based on uh, the ability, as we said, the initial readiness and then the ability to continue to turn and the fact that we turn away two assault battalions. Uh, and it requires that the active cut even deeper. So right now we're at a 23 percent cut, and we would continue to cut two more attack battalions out of the active component, leaving two of our divisions without a full AC uh, per, uh, aviation brigade. And again, when you model that, even with the additional battalions within the Guard, it underperforms by 12 percent the ability to meet our MCO demand. So that's first. The second, then, is the overall capability. Remember, there's only 690 helicopters. So to make extra battalions out of those same 690 helicopters, there's only one way that that's done, and that is to assume away the requirement for an OR, for an operational reserve float. Now, a lot of people don't fully understand what an ORF is, and therefore they have this vision in their mind of a flight line somewhere with 67 perfectly good Apaches sitting there dying to be used with no aviators and no force structure on them because we just want to have them just in case. But that's not how an ORF works. That's not how this works. Remember that we are currently building these A-64Es using remanufactured A-64Ds. All right? So every single one of them right now are going to have to be remanufactured. Remanufactured A-64s are in the $20 million range. Brand new, new metal A-64Es are in the $45 plus million range. Fully burdened cost is what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're doing all the remanufactured because in case I didn't mention it, we lost a lot of money. So we're gonna go the cheapest route possible to get to the 690. With that 690, I've got here in front of me what we've programmed for in the 1519 Palm. For instance, in FY17, we hope to remanufacture 69 aircraft. In FY18, we'd like to remanufacture 72 aircraft. We would like to negotiate, for my friends here from Boeing, a multi-year contract with you at a floor of the economic knee in the curve of at least 48, so that every year across the multi-year, we're getting at least 48 per year. But for all of those numbers, that means you have that many D models that you're taking off of a flight line, if you don't have an ORF, and you are putting into the remanufacture line. 
And oh, by the way, we also at any given time have around 10 that are at our depots, you know, that we crashed and damaged, and now we're going to try and put Humpty Dumpty back together again, and it takes a year or two in some cases to do that. And so when you put it all together, we've got a requirement for anywhere from 55 to 80-something aircraft that are in some form of remanufacture or rebuild and therefore unavailable on a flight line. And so when you build extra battalions out of ORF aircraft, you are building ghost battalions. You're building empty battalions with no readiness, no utility, and no capability. And that is not the kind of hollow force that we want. We want trained and ready. In the ARI plan, we end up with 67 ORF aircraft, 67. And I told you how many we need for remanufacture just over some of the next years. So there will be some years where we will still have small holes potentially on the flight line. But that's why the GAR proposal for us does not meet the needs of the war fight it is slightly more expensive. It's a lot more expensive if we then have to procure an ORF above and beyond, all right? Now, it's true that we have about 40 more D models today than the 690 requirement. So there is 40 there that we could help put into remanufacture to help us with that. But we continue to attrit anywhere from two to five Apaches a year. And so that number is gonna continue to go down over the next 10 to 15 years to finish the procurement of the AH-64E before we end up at our final destination of 690 Echo Model Apaches. Does that answer your question? What I want to make sure is this is not about the capabilities of the individual Apache pilots or the Apache units in the Guard who have all served in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, and are enormously proud and should be of, of what they've done. The same thing with the United States Army Reserve. So, so we, we have right now as we speak at, in Kentucky, a U.S. Army Reserve Apache unit is transitioning to UH-60s. Now, if you went out there and asked them, would they have rather stayed AH-64 pilots? They're proud AH-64 pilots. But they know that the needs of the nation are for them to transition to that aircraft, and they're staying with the unit, and they're going to get the resources, and they're going to get modern aircraft, and they are going to be an important part of the war fight. So when done, Army Aviation will have a greater percentage of its helicopters in the reserve component than in the active force than when we started. When it's done, most of the aircraft disproportionately are coming out of the active component. It's just how we mix those aircraft. And according to, a, you know, RAM's got a good report out that says the, the most cost-effective aircraft for the reserve component are those that are the Chinooks and the Blackhawks. Because of the complexity and expenses, they're the most expensive <coughs> ones to keep in the reserve component. And so if you're going to pay the incremental cost, the extra cost for the pilots and the active component, right, it makes sense from a cost perspective, which is where I come from, to put the, the least cost-effective aircraft in the active and instead of the other way around. Okay. Other questions, or I'll, I'll pile on a little bit. Um, okay, we've got two right here. We'll go in the back first and then come up. Michael Tint, I just wanted to ask if you could ex um, explain a bit more about the, the changes in training. And you seem, you seem to imply that you're going to be saving money in, in the, the process of changing the training routines, and I was especially interested in hearing about that. So your question is about the uh, LUH-72 in the training base? Yeah, and the, and the integration of, uh, of uh, men and men. Uh, it sounded like you were talking about the training, uh, training men and men together. Um, OK, yeah so, yeah, so let's start with uh, the LUH-72. And that the, the idea, the big idea here is that uh, we are divesting in the, in the Army, the total. 798 aircraft. So that's that's where we have to start. Of, of aircraft that we're flying today, 798 go away. Uh, the big idea with the training base, the LUH-72, was to take aircraft that we already own, both in the active component and the reserve component, and put those aircraft down at Fort Rucker. Now, the original plan was 
to take half, about half, of the National Guard's aircraft, the LUH-72s, and seed uh, the training base with those, along with almost all of the active component LUHs. Uh, as General Ferrari described, we are going to procure at a cost of about $600 million, 100 additional LUH-72s that enable the National Guard to retain 212 uh, aircraft. So our requirement down at Fort Rucker is going to be on the order of a couple hundred uh, LUH-72s. The, the paradigm shift that we talked to folks about down at Fort Rucker uh, that we think needs to take place is going from a single engine world to a dual engine world. We have been flying single engine aircraft for a long time, right? And our experience in the training base was uh, informed by our experience in, in Vietnam. And the question for a lot of our pilots, a lot of our student pilots when we were flying, wasn't uh, one of when you're going to fall out of the sky, it was, uh, or if you're going to fall out of the sky, it was when, uh, either by some hostile act or some kind of a uh, malfunction because we did not have redundant systems. Um, as we moved into a dual engine universe down at the training base, uh, we did not make, fully make the transition to the dual engine uh, training paradigm. So we still see a lot of the same things happening down at Fort Rucker in terms of training for failures that almost never happen in the real world, right? We don't really see too many dual engine uh, failures out there. Uh, so do we need to continue to put the uh, resources and emphasis on that uh, in the training base? And we contend that there are some uh, savings to be gained out there. So um, the nature of flight school, we think, is going to change to a degree. Now, basic training is basic training. There's some fundamentals that you have to, you have to address. Um, but we think it is far better to start out a student in a dual engine, glass cockpit world, which is the world that he's going to live in for the rest of his time in the Army. And the transition from LUH-72 into any one of our modernized glass cockpit aircraft, UH-60, CH-47, or, or Apaches, is going to be much, much easier. So you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the cost associated with it? Because that's one of the things that comes well, up frequently. I also want to add that, again, it's about efficiencies. All right, so keep in mind that when we only have four types of helicopters, and one of them is also the trainer, right? So the LUH is the trainer, but the National Guard will still have 212 of those out there flying all over the 54 states and territories. Uh, and so every aviator that comes out of flight school will now be rated in 50% of the Army's aircraft type. And so all the additional transitions and things that we put through people later, that all goes away. You know, an Apache pilot that comes out of flight school here in a year uh, is also rated in uh, the LUH. And so if they want to get out and go into the Guard, for instance, they don't have to get a transition. They already fly 212 of the Guard's helicopters. So you gain a lot of efficiencies associated with that. Stop training people to fly helicopters they're never going to see again in their life uh, is, is part of what we're looking at there. Now, the LUH is more expensive to operate than a TH-67 or, you know, uh, equivalent type aircraft. There's no question about that. However, the cost of operating the LUH will go down as we pull 100 of them out of the active component where they're on small contract-based maintenance uh, all over the Army, and now you consolidate into one larger contract at Rucker, so that lowers your cost. Plus, the op tempo for the LUH goes up so that the parts procurement goes down somewhat. So we will lower the overall operating cost for all of our LUHs, but they'll still be more than what it was for a TH-67. However, we also expect that when we stop spending a large portion of the first half of flight school teaching people to line up on lane seven and do yet another touchdown auto rotation to the ground, that you can, in fact, reduce the overall length of that stage of flight school. And so all of that is something that Rucker is working through right now, is what the new program of instruction will be as we have this complete paradigm shift into the modern world. And I notice we have some international officers here in, in uh, Australian uniforms inspire me to mention that we took lessons from what we saw in Australia, where they've already done this and, and gotten away from the touchdown auto rotation world. 
the Germans who already use the EC-135 as their primary training helicopter, which is a slightly earlier version of the LUH. Uh, so one of the things we did was look out at the rest of the world and how are other people teaching their young aviators how to fly aircraft. Hi, George Nicholson, a policy consultant for special operations. When you look at medevac uh, operations that are being conducted, a few years ago, when Secretary Gates went to Afghanistan and saw the inability to meet the one-hour time frame, he looked at the Air Force HH-60 sitting there and said, why can't they be used? And General Norty Swartz, the chief of staff of the Air Force, agreed. But what's happening right now is the air rescue capability when the Air Force has not done a single rescue since 1972. It's been done by Special Operations Command or the Marines. The Air Rescue Association is saying, well, we're better qualified than the Army. We're the force of choice in Afghanistan right now if they want to be rescued because the Army can't retu return fire. They're having to wait for an accompanying aircraft. They don't have FLIR. Uh, is the Army doing anything uh, to, to solve that problem? Okay, not really part of the Aviation Restructure Initiative, so I'll just be very brief in saying that the Army takes nothing more serious than our medevac capability. One of the things that we've done is we've expanded that capability in quantity, both on the ground in theater and overall. We have expanded the training for our medics, so the back-enders. We have introduced the ability to issue blood products to, uh, you know, our, our severely wounded individuals, you know, and, and introduce that now into, the, into our programs for teaching our medics. Uh, you know, so we continue to grow that capability. All of the medevac that were in theater are now equipped with FLIR, so we have that FLIR capability as well. Uh, so I think we've, uh, we've addressed that very well uh, and gotten after that golden hour uh, and shown the dedication led by many key leaders uh, in the Army over the last several years, as well as Secretary Gates, to, to address that capability. Let me also just add, we did a, a interview with one of the commanders on the ground right now of a cab in, in Afghanistan who specifically addresses what he's doing for Medivac, um, and it'll be posted on our website in the next week or two, I think. So. One last comment on that. We've got, as you probably follow, over you know, 50 Medivac aircraft uh, downrange in uh, more than a, you know, lots of different locations. and. Uh, uh, one of the things I have to do on behalf of the Army is submit a report every uh, month to the Secretary of Defense, uh, through the Secretary of the Army to the Secretary of Defense, about the number of missions that are flown out of standard, outside of the, uh, the golden hour, if you will. And I'm happy to say that uh, we are 99% uh, of the time well within compliance, even as our uh, assets are, are stretched. So we, we think the, uh, the assets we have uh, in theater are, are doing remarkably better than we were at the uh, onset. Back to the training question, uh, Rudy Ostovich used to command Fort Rucker at the time that we wrote the initial requirement for what is today the training helicopter. And in those days, it was very important for us to have a light single engine helicopter because cost was a big deal. and. Um, we were eating up about 25% of the Army's flying hour program at Fort Rucker training aviators, training them how to become fundamental basic Army aviators, and then they'd transition into more sophisticated aircraft. Cost is still a big issue, uh, as we just heard all morning long. Um, it sounds as if the Army has come to a decision that there's a new requirement for a training helicopter. You described it as dual engine, glass cockpit, modern systems. Uh, and I hear that we're going to buy about 100 uh, UH-72s at a cost of $1.3 billion. Um, what surprises me is that we haven't gone through the disciplined process of crafting a new training helicopter requirement and then putting that out to industry for full and open competition. So it seems as if we're about to spend over a billion dollars to take no longer existing helicopters, but actually buy 100 new helicopters without fair and open competition. I know you've thought through that, uh, but I think the audience needs to understand your rationale. Thanks, sir. 
Appreciate that. Uh, I'm not sure where you got your numbers on the cost. Uh, they're significantly inflated from what we're actually going to have to pay for those helicopters. So that's first of all. Second of all, the, remember the original concept here was take aircraft that we already own, already pay to fly, move those to Fort Rucker, and use those helicopters, as has been an Army tradition for many years. John and I learned to fly in the venerable UH-1 Iroquois that the Army already owned. There was no competition for that training helicopter. We took them, we moved them to Fort Rucker, and we used them. A few years later, we did the same thing with OH-58 Alpha Charlies and moved them to Fort Rucker. No competition. We used what we already owned, and we used that until such time as we eventually did buy the TH-67 helicopter. So following in that same model of using what we already owned because we didn't have the money to go out and buy anything else, that was the model. Now, as we said, as the National Guard addressed their concerns to the Secretary of Defense going through this process, one of the things that, that they said was, hey, we're really not happy about losing the LUHs that we have. We believe we have a firm requirement for 212 LUHs, and we really want to use them. They're spread across so many states and territories. And they made that argument. Uh, and so as a compromise, the Secretary of Defense agreed and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We are going to allow you to keep all 212 of your LUHs as a compromise. We will, in turn, come back to the Army and not force the Army to buy, but rather give us money, additional money, to procure the extra 100 LUHs that make up essentially the reserve component half of the training fleet. And they did that as a compromise. That is a directed requirement to us to go ahead and do that. But again, going out in free and open competition only for the 100 would now create two training helicopters. Uh, it also would add another fleet of aircraft. It would also get back into the qualifying people on aircraft they will never fly again and complicate our overall problem. We want to lean down to four fleets and four fleets only and focus every dollar we have on keeping those four fleets relevant and capable for the future. It's important on the cost, right, So, as it, which is one of my big concerns, obviously. Uh, when, when you have more aircraft, the logistics burden of supporting that and, and training on it becomes enormous. So while it appears that putting the LUH on its face are more expensive than what we got, when you take the 100 that we already own, so those are zero cost, you put them there. They were already <coughs> flying, so we were already paying to fly them and you put them there, so you take that money and move it, and you get rid of the entire cost for the fleet that's there, right, it turns out to be an enormous cost savings. And then when you're able to do what John and Frank talked about, which is shorten the flight training and not introduce another aircraft, but bring more LUH in, so that, if because if you brought in a new trainer, you'd have to train those pilots who go on, on that trainer to, tr to go on the LUH to go to the guard, right? You have to run a transition course. So, so it makes, that's why we did it, is we're buying what we already own and using the aircraft we already own to avoid the cost of buying a new fleet. So if I could make one comment, sir, on the, uh, the fact that we're getting smaller, the Army's getting smaller, and that's one of the things that we uh, had to contend with uh, in, inside the building uh, and outside the building, is that the, the idea and the acceptance of the fact that we're going from 490 to 450 or less, and uh, what that means in terms of cuts. Everyone thinks that those 40,000 people, that delta between 490 and 450 is somebody else's, uh, somebody else's organization or unit or asset. And the uh, fact of the matter it is, for the aviation restructure, uh, we're going to reduce, as General Ferrari said, from 25 brigades down to 22 or less. And uh, when you do that, you reduce flight school, and you reduce flight school from a high last year of 1,300 students going through down to what will probably be a steady state of about 900 students a year. Thank you, sir. Dave Wood. Uh, I'm a former Guard Combat Aviation Brigade Commander. Uh, just, just I know that with the XORD that transferred the AH-64s out of the USAR to the uh, uh, to the active unit, they they were basically they got a one for one uh, exchange. 
Now, as I understand it, uh, with transitioning eight ARBs out of the guard, 111 aircraft probably aren't a one-for-one -one exchange, but I'm curious as to, you, you talk about these being modernized airframes. Are these going to be Alphas, Limas, Mikes? What, what kind of aircraft are we expecting to get? Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. I'm glad you mentioned the XORD that is transferring from the USAR to the active uh, their Apaches, because that X order actually transferred two from the USAR, and as General Ingram agreed to last April, over a year ago, and before restructure began, it also transfers two battalions out of the National Guard. That just had not begun yet. With the same one uh, and the same one-for-one one type deal, okay? Uh, and so then there's the remaining 61 aircraft that you also get, and again, we're getting smaller, so they can't all continue to be a one-for-one one as we go, but there's an overall growth in the National Guard of 111. Now, as to what type of aircraft, they will all be UH-60 Limas, okay? So the Army has over 700 Alpha models still that we are working aggressively across all compos to get out of the fleet. And that's where, again, this by focusing on just four types of aircraft, we increase the rate of production and procurement of UH-60 mics, which will benefit the National Guard so they can continue to push Alpha models out. And these LEMAs, which will go in to fill the new force structure, right, the two battalions that are complete swaps that were already agreed to, as well as some of the new force structure that is built based on the new design in the National Guard, those will all already be LEMAs so that we can continue to focus on getting rid of Alpha models. All right, and we've briefed this to the National Guard Bureau in terms of great detail of where these lemas come from. All right, but the beauty of this plan, there's some understandable concern from some folks in the National Guard that, oh yeah, we've heard this before, sure. We're, you, we're gonna give you some Blackhawks and take some Apaches. So you'll come take the Apaches and then two, three years later, maybe we start seeing some Blackhawks. But again, remember, we are using aircraft that we already own. I'm not waiting on anything to come off a production line to be able to hand over these lemas. So the commitment from day one has been that they will both be lemas and that we will be able to deliver said lemas either simultaneous or ahead of the taking away of any of the AH-64s. Does that make sense? Thank you. Good question. And as far, okay. as, far as the structure, right? So. The guard structure in the plan, both for sequestration and the president's plan, comes down at a less of a rate than the active structure. So it's 14% under full sequestration for the active force, 10% for the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve, and it's about eight and four under the president's plan. The eight and four gets you a 980,000 person army, which consists of 450,000 in the active, 335 in the Army National Guard and 195, right? So that allows, by, by not taking the structure out proportionally, it allows the Guard to have those structures and maintain those eight aviation brigades, and then the battalions and how they sort out those UH-60s, they can reallocate from, from across the states, and, and that structure will be there for them to do that. Once again, right? The, the pilots that are out there in these units are, are extraordinarily, you know, they're, they're great citizens, they, they have jobs, they fly a tremendous amount of time to, to stay proficient. And, and we want to take advantage of their dedication and expertise. And so that's why we've reduced them dramatically less than the active component, so that we can leverage their unique capabilities and their dedication. Uh, Mike Miller with Raytheon. Um, staying in the vein of efficient use of what you already have, uh, when ARI was first rolled out, there was some reporting that using the Apaches in the scout role was an interim solution. It wasn't a purpose-built aircraft for that mission. Uh, if that's true, does the Army intend to revisit, <clears throat> excuse me, the requirement to develop a new armed aerial scout aircraft? And if so, what does that timeline look like? Thank you. That's a great question. One of the things that we said throughout this process is that the Army retains the requirement for an armed aerial scout. That is still a valid requirement. It will be filled in this ARI plan with the teaming of the AH-64E 
and the UAV. We do not have the money today to uh, go forward on an armed, new build armed aerial scout program. That could change, and thus we keep the requirement as we, we think it's a significant and important requirement. Uh, but right now, we don't have the avenue to pursue that directly. However, there are some interesting things out there in industry that are being looked at that could get after an armed aerial scout type requirement. We are still looking at what we're doing about our little bird in our soft community uh, for replacement there. And so if certain things happen, maybe associated with the joint multi-role or the future vertical lift uh, that produce something that is affordable, i.e. no more expensive than what we pay for a reman A864, uh, then we could relook at what our options are. But we don't have the money today to go after that in a, in a fully funded program, if that makes sense. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, can you briefly address the restructuring of uh, aerial uh, Sorry, Can you uh, identify ISR? yourself quickly? Sorry. Pardon me? By yourself. Oh, Richard Reinke. Can you dis briefly discuss restructuring of manned aerial ISR? And a follow-up to it is uh, COCO, contractor on contractor operator ops have been significant recently in the past 10 years on the QRC function. Is there any role for COCO in the future? That, that's really best answered by some, uh, some of our uh, UAS folks and our G2 partners. Uh, and you know, as far as the aviation restructure initiative goes, we haven't really delved into the fixed wing platforms at all. This is really a rotary wing specific uh, initiative and uh, leaves the ISR uh, plan as it has been rolled out uh, intact. So there's no no, no changes to that per se. Um, I, I can put you in. I, I can talk to you uh, offline, and let's uh, let's get you in touch with the right people to answer what questions you have about the uh, the ISR uh, plan. Okay. I'm the other Mike Miller from Bell Helicopter, and I'd like to follow up on AAS. You know, you stated that uh, we're retaining that as a requirement, but uh, you've divested yourself in the Aviation Restructure Initiative from single-engine aircraft. You're going to twin-engine trainers. Are you going to expect the AAS to be a twin-engine aircraft? That's not absolutely a requirement. Uh, it, it would be desirable. Uh, for all of the same reasons that twin engines are desirable to start with in terms of their survivability, combat capability, lift capability, et cetera. But it is not necessarily uh, a requirement. What we know is, is that all of our existing airframes in, a in ARI are going to be twin engine. Uh, if we, it, so it makes sense for the trainer to be geared towards what everybody is flying. If we did at some time in the future make a decision to go to a single engine platform in some small numbers, uh, then we would have to adjust how that individual platform was trained, but it does not change our overall uh, training concept. Uh, any, any other questions right now from folks? Okay, let me dive in on a couple uh, questions, if I could, outside of the ARI. Um, there's been increased reporting of the Army um, increasing its efforts to try to operate rotorcraft off of ships. So can you talk a little bit about where that's heading and uh, how you plan to deal with the marinization challenges associated with that? Um, what's, the, what's the future look like? So I can uh, start, and I'm sure uh, Colonel Tate will chime in on, on this one as well. It is true we have uh, delved into our uh, shipboard uh, capability, our maritime capability. It's a, it seems to be uh, a growth capability. Uh, we do sense that there is increasing demand out there. In fact, we have uh, ongoing missions happening in CENTCOM as well as uh, other places in the uh, uh, in Korea, um, 
So there is a, and, and, and the folks in Hawaii work closely with the Navy. Um, the question in my mind, and we've relayed this to the folks out there at our ASCCs, is that we've got to make sure that we've got the appropriate demand signal coming in from our combatant commanders. We want to make sure that that is, uh, that is in fact the case, and so that, that will focus our efforts uh, in a world of limited resources. And that's really one of the concerns that we have is that, you know, how much maritime capability do we need, does the Army need to, to invest in? Certainly some is the answer, but what's the right amount? And we, right now, we're um, working in tw places like the 12th Aviation Brigade <laughs> in, uh, in Italy and, as I said, Hawaii and Korea. And those are forays. Those are those are uh, those are uh, experiments, and in some cases, uh, limited operational um, capabilities that are being developed. But uh, in terms of what the long-term maritime capabilities are, in terms of demand for the Army, I think that uh, we still have some work to do. You want to talk a little bit about Hawaii? Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that the Army's been doing maritime operations off of U.S. Navy warships for a very long time. Uh, I was in 417 CAV uh, back in the day in the early 90s, uh, a unit that was initially formed as a special operations unit flying off of the backs of uh, short deck frigates and uh, various platforms around the world. Uh, we uh, enforced the embargo of Haiti in the early 90s, uh, again off the back of short deck frigates. Uh, with those Kiowa warriors. We uh, ultimately occupied Haiti uh, out of helicopters coming off of U.S. Navy aircraft carriers from the 10th Aviation Brigade. Uh, we have special operations that routinely operate off. So the Army is not new to this idea of maritime operations and shipboard operations. There are challenges associated with it, and, and I think you mentioned already uh, the uh, issue of the salt water and the corrosion control. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to have a conference down at Redstone to talk more about that and what things the Army may or may not need to do to improve that. But a lot of it just comes down to the discipline of fresh water rinses in your turbine engines after every single flight, fresh water rinses of the entire aircraft. You know, I lived at sea for months off the coast of Haiti, uh, and you know, as long as we did those things, we're able to take care of the aircraft. So we can conduct maritime operations. And I think that, especially as the Army is increasingly CONUS-based, uh, the ability to project power off of naval platforms is, is just one more important quiver, uh, or arrow in the quiver, if you will, for the U.S. Army. Uh, in the Pacific theater, in particular, there's a lot of interest with that, and the 25th Combat Aviation Brigade that I used to command is an ideal unit to continue to develop those tactics, techniques, and procedures because that unit already operates within 10 nautical miles of saltwater every single day, which means they're already dealing with all those corrosion issues. They already have all the appropriate equipment in terms of helicopter emergency egress devices, they all, we have a dunker there in Hawaii, so they're all dunker certified, uh, you know, and you happen to have Pearl Harbor and a giant naval fleet there. So perfect place to continue to work those tactics, techniques, and procedures. And obviously the Pacific Theater has a lot of ocean, as well as though a lot of land mass and a lot of the largest armies in the world. So it's a great marriage of our maritime capability with our army capabilities. And so with respect to those other armies, um, can you talk a little bit about how you see, and this may be more a question for you, John, uh, about the role of Army aviation in regionally aligned forces? Well, one of the th interesting uh, initiatives that we have uh, underway in the Army is the uh, idea of an aviation uh, mobile training team, which is uh, an idea that uh, matches some of our uh, aviation expertise that we will pull out of our uh, both uh, institutional uh, organizations as well as our uh, aviation brigades across uh, Forces Command and uh, other, other places around the world in order to marry them up with uh, other uh, nations based on uh, requests for uh, specific kinds of uh, training assistance. And uh, that is sort of a, uh, a hybrid model that uh, is, is uh, 
uh, not permanent, but uh, it is ad hoc in nature, task organized based on the, uh, the, the requirements that uh, come into us. So uh, that's just one of the ideas that I think is, uh, is out there. Uh, it's not specifically uh, regionally aligned forces. Uh, regionally aligned forces for, um, for Army aviation is uh, probably uh, the best example we have is the 1st Infantry Division and uh, the work that's ha go going on in uh, several places throughout uh, Africa. And uh, uh, again, these are small organization tailored for very specific missions. And I think the, the, the model that aviation will fall in on is going to be very similar to what uh, the Army is doing with their brigade combat teams. Have any other questions from the audience? Okay. I think we might let you guys go home early. Um, thanks very much to all three of you for coming over. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for taking the time. And uh, we look forward to having you back in future sessions on Rotorcraft. Take care. Thank you.